Hayao Miyazaki might not be a name that is instantly recognized by Americans like Steven Spielberg or Martin Scorsese, but if you've met anybody that can't stop talking about Spirited Away, then you're probably familiar with this guy's work in some sort of fashion. From My Neighbor Totoro to Princess Mononoke, this guy has made Studio Ghibli's most iconic films to date. And most people out there would give him the title of not only the best animator of all time, but also just one of the best filmmakers to ever live. So today, I wanna sit down and rank all of them, from my least favorite to the one that stands out the most in his catalog. I've never really been an anime person because to me, most of it tends to look like this. The only thing I desired in this world was for you to ravenously eat my love. But lately I can't stop thinking about how much I want to devour your glorious throbbing love instead. So keep that in mind as I talk about all of these movies. I'm no expert on the subject, but I do like pretty much every single movie in Miyazaki's body of work. And between everything on this list and Attack on Titan, I've been convinced to give certain anime films and shows a chance. So if you have any recommendations, be sure to comment them down below so I could add it to my never ending watch list. Or if you would like me to do a full on Studio Ghibli ranked video eventually, let me know down below so that way I could start binging the rest of the studio's work. I will say this though, how you feel about one of Miyazaki's movies will most likely determine how you feel about the rest of his movies. It's incredibly rare to find directors that are this consistent throughout their decades of work. So if one of these is one of your favorite movies of all time, chances are seven of the other ones are on your top 100 movies list as well. But if you have tried a couple of these and it's not really your cup of tea, I'd find it hard to believe that any one of these films would make you do a complete 180 on your opinion of this guy's style. But that's the beauty of finding and talking about about movies. But to just get it out of the way now, the animation in every single one of these films is stunning in its own unique way. And I'm not gonna waste your time with repeating that point when it comes to talking about each of these. Also, I am somebody that prefers the dubs to watching it with subtitles, and if you think that is sacrilegious, I'm sorry that you get to miss out on some of the most stacked voice acting ensembles ever put to screen. Seriously, almost every single one of these has at least three incredible names attached to it. And how could you not wanna hear Michael Keaton Eaton voice an anti-war pig who also happens to be the best pilot in Italy. I would never watch a dubbed version of anything live action, but for anime and especially Studio Ghibli, I don't know, it just feels like so much care is put into the English voiceovers that why would I not watch those? And with all of that out of the way, let's go through and rank all of the films of Hayao Miyazaki, starting with my least favorite. <laughs> I had to put one movie on the bottom, okay? I know the fan base for this is a dedicated one, and if this is your favorite Miyazaki film, I'm happy you enjoy it. But I have seen this twice now, and I do get the appeal, but that appeal is just really not for me. I would consider myself a science fiction fan, kind of. If a certain project is hitting for me, it hits hard. Hard. But when it feels like territory that is too familiar to a bunch of other things I've seen before, it takes a lot for me to sit through the entire thing. And for me, Nausicaa falls into that second category. Admittedly, the lore and the world building here is really solid, especially with that awesome opening sequence. And I do like the direness of the story with how dark it gets in the final act. But at the end of the day, this movie just bores the shit out of me. I really hate it when it feels like almost every other line a character says is some sort of exposition. And I think Nausicaa does that the most out of every movie on here. I mean, her entire first scene is just her talking out loud about every single thing we are seeing for the first time. And it's just really eye rolling for me. And I know you need that kind of dialogue for kids movies, but this along with most of Miyazaki's other work is clearly not made for children. Even if Miyazaki himself has always said that his main goal at Studio Ghibli was to make good movies for kids. But Nausicaa and a couple other ones on this list, I wouldn't really qualify as great kids movies. I know Miyazaki is passionate about all life on this planet and dedicated this whole film to preserving the life of insects, but I'm sorry, I'm still gonna kill any mosquito that gets in my way. I hate how I have to put this so low on the list because I've always considered it to be a pretty underrated movie. Lupin the Third started off as a weekly manga series in Japan that eventually spawned a bunch of different animated television series and films for quite a few decades. And it just so happens that Miyazaki's first film was a Lupin the Third picture, The Castle of Cagliostro. Now this is the only Lupin piece of media I have consumed, so I don't know much about how this ranks within that franchise. What I do know is that this is a really fun movie. From the opening sequence, 
sequence, you know you are in the hands of a passionate storyteller, and it remains consistently fun throughout the entire story. These main two characters are just so great to kill time with, and they give you the feeling you'd get after watching a Scooby-Doo movie, where the crew is so fun that you get the urge to go off and binge like four more of them that same day. But even though I do have a really good time with this one, I don't think it necessarily elevates to the levels that some of these later picks do. It's an incredibly basic story with your princess, mysterious lost castle, and all of the traps and little twists along the way. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. I'm just somebody that prefers getting a little bit more out of a movie most of the time. I also think that the two main heroes are so fun that they make every single other character seem like the most basic pieces of wood imaginable. And even though Miyazaki still gets some credit for that here, I think you have to give a lot of respect to Lupin's original creators for making it this easy for him in the first place. But at the end of the day, I just feel like every other movie on this list is about something. And this one is just about entertaining you. And I don't need every movie to be about something, but I do think those kinds of movies are usually a bit more up my alley. But when it comes to directional debuts that show off potential of what a filmmaker will end up becoming, this one's pretty solid. <laughs> I have similar feelings on this one as I do with Castle of Cagliostro. This is a pretty by the books adventure movie filled with fun characters and cool action sequences that really take advantage of their animation medium. I mean, every single time I watch the train sequence, I'm blown away with everything that fills up the frame. And I think it's within those moments that Castle in the Sky shines at its brightest. I also can't talk about this movie without at least mentioning Dola, who is definitely one of the standout characters from all of Miyazaki's work. She has the best comedic lines of the entire movie, but that motherly figure charm comes out as the story plays out and it's really great to see. So why does it rank this low on the list? Well, I think just like Miyazaki's take on Lupin the Third, this movie doesn't give me much more than, hey, here's a cool adventure for you. I've just seen the let's go find the magical city story so many times. And this one doesn't distinguish itself enough from that pack to get me excited to rewatch it again. Laputa is a cool city, but be careful how you say it around your Spanish speaking people because it does not mean castle in the sky for them, okay? Also, maybe I am the problem here, but how much older are these pirates compared to Sheeta? This girl looks 15 max, and these guys look so old you'd think the airship belonged to Epstein. The two hour runtime also feels a lot longer than that, and I think a lot of that has to do with the pacing consistently changing from things are happening too fast to things are taking too long to get going. And it makes the story feel stretched out too thin. But what do I know? I'm just a Laputa. There might be some recency bias here, plus the fact that this is the only film on the entire list that I've only seen once, but The Boy and the Heron was a bit of a letdown for me. But that was close to not being the case at all, because the first act is possibly my favorite 30 minutes of Studio Ghibli filmmaking. There is such a dark nature to the way this thing opens that at times it felt like Miyazaki was going for a horror movie vibe or something. I mean, the Heron has got to be one of the most original creature designs I have ever seen put to screen, and Robert Pattinson's voice work just adds a whole other layer to this fucked up looking thing. And until the story shifts gears and reveals what is actually going on, I was glued to the screen. But once these characters sink into the floor and go into their spirited away-esque world, I think the story sinks with it. It just feels like repeated territory of what we have experienced before in Miyazaki's other better work, while also going through story beats that don't feel as impactful at what was being set up in the first episode. Act. On paper, I love the fantasy idea of having a child build a connection with their parents at the same age as them. But between this and Petite Maman, I guess this type of story just doesn't work for me the same way it does for other people, even if I do prefer this film over that one. And while I am happy to be living in a world where Miyazaki is still making movies, I feel like The Wind Rises has a better final film feel to it compared to this one. I can see why some people would think this is the better send off with that baton pass type of ending, but I'll make my defense for his last final film later in the video. I'm happy so many of you are falling in love with this movie and even David Ehrlich declared it as the best of last year and maybe my mind will change on a rewatch considering that happened to me with one of his other movies that I like a good amount more now. It didn't leave me confused at all, I just think it was one or two drafts away from being fully fleshed out. Even though it seems like Miyazaki prioritizes his visuals first and just tries to create a story around that later in the production. And I think that mentality hurts the boy in the Heron more than any other film he has made. Also, the original title, How Do You Live, is just vastly superior to what we got. 
I used to fucking hate Ponyo. It was just the annoying kids movie that kept getting under my nerves. And maybe I have better taste now, or maybe I finally transformed into an emotional human being, or maybe I have bad taste now, I don't know. But the charm of Ponyo got to me on the rewatch. The same thing actually happened to me when I rewatched The Florida Project, a movie that I really didn't like when I first saw it, but ended up really working for me when I realized that kids aren't all that bad. There is just something about stepping into the shoes of these two young characters that really makes you long to go back to your childhood, which is something that I think most movies about kids tends to fail at accomplishing. I know I said I wouldn't talk about the animation for these movies, but this guy and his team went off here. All of the underwater sequences are absolutely beautiful to look at, with so many things moving in each background, and it's pretty hard to not at least acknowledge that part of the movie. You've probably also heard this a million times, but this is Miyazaki's most childish movie in his filmography. And I do think there is a distinction between a kid's movie and a family movie that most people tend to not distinguish at all between, but this one definitely falls on the children's movie side of the scale. And I guess that can be viewed as a positive or a negative depending on how old you are. It was a negative for me on the first viewing, but this time around, I really tried to put myself in the mindset of a kid watching this for the first time. And I think it succeeds at being that kind of movie. I mean, Ryan, the editor, put this on for his three-year-old son, and it sounds like they both had a great time with it. It might not be the most inspirational movie for parents though, just because the mom in this drives like an absolute maniac. But one thing I will complain about, which you might notice is becoming a bit of a trend for Miyazaki here is that by the third act, I think the film becomes a little exhausting. I keep going back to Miyazaki explaining how he draws the story first and has the rest play out from there. And I think that has a negative impact on the second and third acts of most of these films. But again, when the animation is this good and the characters are this cute, it's hard to get too upset. <laughs> If there was an odd one out entry in Miyazaki's body of work, it would probably be The Wind Rises. You wouldn't expect the guy who made Ponyo to follow it up with a biopic about a chief aerospace engineer during World War II, but also this guy is obsessed with planes and grew up during the end of World War II. So I can see why he wanted to push himself out of his comfort zone for what was supposed to be his final, final film, because this was like his third time trying to retire. Miyazaki has been notorious for pushing the limits of his capabilities though which is probably why so many people don't really like working for the guy. And I've never worked for him, so he could be the biggest asshole alive. But from the outside looking in, I have massive respect for a filmmaker or anybody in any profession who is obsessed with always one-upping themselves. And although I wouldn't consider The Wind Rises to be my favorite Miyazaki film, I do appreciate it for that exact reason. And I got into this a lot more on my second viewing. The reason I consider this to be a better retirement film than The Boy and the Heron is because of how that love of engineering can also be seen as Miyazaki's love for animation. It's about making consistent changes to something just to make it 1% better. It's about falling in love and balancing that new life with your career. It's about creating something that you find beautiful, even though it'll be used for mass destruction and not a single plane you worked on would come back from that war. I think the emotional moments hit so much harder here because of the animation. Like moments where that woman collapses on the hill just are ingrained in my head. With all of that being said though, I just don't love aerospace engineering the same way Miyazaki does. And while I can appreciate much of this story and its passion from its characters, there are a lot of conversations that just go over my head whenever they start talking about blueprints for their newest model. And I think for that reason, I'm never eager to give this one another rewatch. I wouldn't go far enough to call it boring, but I could see a lot of people feeling that way when you compare this to everything else we are talking about here. But when it hits, it hits pretty hard. And if you are really into planes, this is probably probably your favorite film of all time. Most would put this in their top three Miyazaki, and I could see the reasonings behind it. Princess Mononoke, more than any other film on this list, is the most anime movie here. In terms of the action that isn't afraid to shy away from gore and tackling a simple yet pretty adult storyline, in many ways this feels like the much better version of Nausicaa, with multiple factions fighting for what they believe is the right thing to do for humanity and destroying nature with every single decision they make in the process. You have a villain who's clearly not the good guy by 
by any means, but at the same time, there is enough context about her intentions that it makes her more complex than some of the other antagonists on this list. I already mentioned the upgrade in the violence here, and in that department, there are a lot of standout moments, specifically with this kid sniping off hands with his arrow or catching one arrow and shooting it right back. I know a lot of people have said that they should make a Zelda movie just like this, and that scene right there was enough to convince me. Even if Illumination will probably just get Jimmy Fallon to voice Toon Link. I also can't mention this movie without mentioning the score because it is beautiful. There is one track from Miyazaki's catalog that I prefer to every track on here, but if we were giving best score to one full album only, I think this one takes it. So with all that praise, why do I rank it this low on the list? Well, I just think the story is a little too bare bones for my taste. I think there is enough to keep somebody entertained for sure, but I don't think it stands out enough when it comes to the history of cinema, and this one ranks pretty high on any top 250 movies of all time list. And besides the villain, I don't find a single one of these characters to be all that interesting. They kind of just feel like NPCs you'd end up talking to in Ocarina of Time. And I never really bought any of the chemistry between anybody on screen the entire time. If this is your favorite movie of all time, don't get too upset. I've given more classic movies three out of five star ratings than I could count, and this is just one of them. And I promise my next pick won't piss you off. No, this is not my number one pick, and no, I am not joking. Most people consider this to be, objectively speaking, the best Hayao Miyazaki movie. Critics consider it one of the best of all time. Movie buffs often have it in their top 10 favorites ever list. And yeah, I think it's, I think it's pretty good. I think I was caught up in a lot of the praise for this on my first viewing and said, yeah, Spirit Away is great. And I still liked it on a rewatch, but honestly, I mostly just get surface level enjoyment from this one. But I rank it as high as I do because of how interesting that surface level storytelling is. Visually, it is one of the most creative movies I have ever seen, and honestly, I ranked it this high because I cannot stress enough how original this movie looks. There are just so many cool creature and location designs that complement everything else in the frame perfectly, and I think the opening 15 minutes would scar me for life if I saw this when I was six years old. But from a storytelling perspective, I think the rest of the movie is just a little too basic, which I know you can say, well, don't you like hangout movies, Chase? Nothing happens in those. And yeah, there is truth to that. I don't need a super complex plot to make a movie one of my favorites, because my personal favorite of all time is still Daisy Confused at the moment. And I'm going to sound like a broken record by this point, but I think this one loses steam the longer it goes on. Sure, there are scenes later on that are iconic, like the obvious train sequence, but the story just moves at such a snail-like pace that I feel like it would be a perfect 98-minute movie. Instead of being dragged out longer than two hours. I don't want to sound like a hater because I do heavily respect this guy and his body of work, but I think Spirited Away and The Boy and the Heron have similar pros and cons that make me feel like I'm alone on an island while talking about the flaws in this guy's filmmaking, because he is inarguably one of the best to ever touch animation. But I just don't find him to be the best storyteller out there. Spirited Away is good, and if this is your favorite movie, you can write a three paragraph essay in the comments explaining why I'm wrong. That's totally cool. But for now, these are the four films that resonate with me a little bit more. Yes, I like Porco Rosso a little more than Spirited Away. Sue me! There is just something about a pig voiced by Michael Keaton who hates everything about government, war, and bums, which just happens to align with my personal taste. And this movie delivers on that exact promise for me. If you can't tell by where we are now on the list, I'm more down with the laid back Miyazaki movies. The ones that just follow people hanging out and living life, compared to the ones where everything in nature is at stake and the world will burn if the protagonist can't save the magical item or creature in time. And what makes Porco Rosso so good is the fact that it combines both of those genres, with even hints of the wind rises in there. It's about this Italian pilot living on a beach, stopping pirates, getting drunk, and flirting with women, but he also happens to be a pig. A pig with a goofy but sad past, and Michael Keaton's voiceover work is perfect in bringing him to life. When he's the cool hangman type, he nails it, but when he shows his more sensitive side while working on his passion, he also nails it. Whenever there is a dogfight on screen, Miyazaki's talent takes over 
where he absolutely nails it. The plane sequences are so well choreographed that it makes you want to jump into the screen, but he also gets that feeling out of you in a much different way when you see this guy just chilling on a beach. In a way, since all these things are combining together, I think this is kind of the Miyazaki movie, even if most people would rank it relatively low on their list. And that honestly surprises me a little bit. It's a movie that's not about much on the surface, but when you have lines like, I'd rather be a pig than a fascist, I get reminded why I'd rather throw this quick 93 minute movie on over most of the other Studio Ghibli films. And even though I don't think every Miyazaki ending sticks the landing, I don't think this one could have wrapped up any better. When I first binged all of Miyazaki's work about eight years ago, Howl's Moving Castle was neck and neck with Spirited Away as my favorite. And even though that one moved a couple spots down, I'm keeping Howl's Moving Castle in almost the same exact spot. I think Miyazaki tackles aging in such an interesting way here through Sophie's main conflict by delivering his message of making the most out of life no matter what phase of it you happen to be in. She's such a lovable character, and honestly, every other character in here is fun to hang out with for the two hour runtime. From a design perspective, I think you could also make the case that this is his best work to date. Sure, you could say that Spirited Away is a more creative film, but I think every single thing that is drawn in every single environment is genuinely interesting, and it's consistent no matter what the scale of something is. Spoiler alert, there is a moving castle in the movie, and it looks just as creepy as it does awesome. But at the same time, you have a kid who could whip out a wizard costume like it's nothing. All of Miyazaki's work has these types of things sprinkled throughout, but I think these complement the story better here than any other movie. But why do I have it at number three? Let's cue that broken record because this movie's ending just flat out sucks. Everything is wrapped up so quickly in the most perfect happy bow that you'd think the Snyder Cut would have dropped by now where all of the gaps are filled in. I guess it was 11.55 and Miyazaki couldn't miss the midnight deadline so he just banged that shit out and pressed upload. And like most of these other movies, I don't think it's just the ending because I think the second half once again starts to lose me a little bit. And I don't even know how that's possible considering this is one of the few movies he adapted from a book but somehow he still manages to make it feel rushed. Some can consider Howl's Moving Castle to be his best, I've seen some people call it his worst, and I've been switching this in my number two pick for a couple of weeks now, but after rewatching all of this guy's stuff, I feel pretty good with my upcoming choices. <laughs> If you are looking for a movie to watch when you're stuck on the couch with a fever and you have a cup of hot soup ready to go, look no further than Kiki's Delivery Service because this is Lo-Fi Girl the movie, all right? And I would argue this is even more chill than putting those beats on in the background. I love a good hangout movie and I can't think of a better animated hangout movie than this one. And it's got everything you could possibly want. Fun protagonist, check. Beach town, check. Baking, check. Random lovable side characters, check. Magic, sure, why not, check. Like I mentioned with Ponyo, there is a pretty big distinction between a kid's movie and a family movie. And while I don't think Kiki's Delivery Service makes the full jump to being only a family movie, I do think it is much closer to it on that spectrum when you compare it to Ponyo. I think what makes films like this and most of Disney's classic catalog feel so timeless is the fact that anybody of any age could get something out of it. It's perfect for young kids who just wanna watch a witch talk to her cat, but I know I've seen people log this three times on Letterboxd when they feel lost in life and are trying to find their purpose. Even though most of Miyazaki's movies are completely original ideas, he doesn't have to think as hard about what happens next since it's mostly predetermined, and he can just focus all of his energy into creating the best visuals possible. And a movie like this doesn't even need the most insane imagery imaginable, but the amount of detail in the cities and landscapes is absolutely beautiful to look at. And if there is one movie I would love to live in, it's this one right here. Again though, even my second favorite movie on the list has the same damn complaint because the ending just ruins a bit of the experience for me. Somehow we go from a teenage witch delivering packages to, oh my God, the ship is collapsing and her best friend is gonna die. It's just so jarring and unnecessary that it really makes me roll my eyes at this point. But even that moment has a nice payoff with Kiki's biggest struggle within the story. And when your biggest flaw has some sort of positive to it, that's how you know you have a pretty special Special movie. And when the rest of the film is this charming, I can't hate on it too hard. <laughs> 
lot of people write this off as being Miyazaki's simplest movie, which I think proves the point as to why this is undeniably one of his best. It's deceptively simple on the surface, following these two sisters as they explore their brand new home and befriend the spirits of the forest. It's got all of the originality that is present in the rest of his movies, but it also has that slice of life hangout film vibe from Kiki's Delivery Service, which if you can't tell by now is one of my absolute favorite genres. But on a rewatch, I got so, so much more out of it than I did on my first viewing, which is not exactly how the rest of my rewatches for Miyazaki went. This is a story of grief, of how a parent keeps things afloat when the other is terminally ill, and how kids keep themselves occupied enough to not process what is going on outside of their own world. It's about how any figure, whether it be a parent, neighbor, or some huge furry monster, can step in during any moment of need and make a child feel protected from everything going on. It portrays how a kid reacts when they finally come to terms with what is going on, and how for them that is truly when they begin to come of age. Even if you don't pick those things up on the first viewing like me though, I think this still works as a lovable turn your brain off and grab a cup of coffee movie. And it's easily one of Studio Ghibli's biggest triumphs. I mean, it's so iconic that Totoro is the damn Mickey Mouse for the studio. And I can't talk about this movie without mentioning Path of the Wind, which is not only the best track from any of Miyazaki's film scores, but also one of my absolute favorites ever. The amount of times I've had this song on loop while working is alarmingly high, but it just never gets old. It's so rare where we get a film that is perfect for anyone of any age, and it would be so easy for a movie like this to lean too heavy on the children's side of things in the same vein that Ponyo did, but I guess that's what makes this guy so popular in the first place. When I look back at all of these movies, it's not the most flashy, and that's what I love about it. Like I said, I think it's cool when movies try to be about something, but I heavily prefer a film that could hint at that point it's making in a much more subtle way, which is something Totoro does better than every other entry on the list. It is a trophy for animation and will be one of the flagships we will always look back on as being one of the best in the genre for a reason, even if the kids' voices get a little annoying in certain parts for me. So you might be thinking, well, Chase, is this guy in your Mount Rushmore a favorite living directors? And it seems like most other YouTubers covering this guy would make him the first entry on their Mount Rushmore. But if you can't tell, for me, he's not even close, at least not now. And that's okay, because do you know how many incredible filmmakers there are out there? We all have different taste, which is why it's so fun for me to listen to bigger fans of Miyazaki talk about his work. And visually, he is undeniably one of the best artists we have. And although filmmaking is inherently visual, it's not the thing that makes a film compelling for me. Because personally, it's not how beautiful your images are, but how those images help tell an amazing story. Yeah, all of these films are incredible to look at, but so many of them feel like they've rushed through plot points or avoid fully developing certain characters at the expense of drawing something cool. So although I can call this guy one of the best animators I have ever witnessed, I probably wouldn't put him in my top 25 favorite directors list. But that doesn't mean he can't be one of yours. I'm so happy that so many of you would put him in your Mount Rushmore of favorite filmmakers and that his work inspires you to create within your own life. As somebody who doesn't smoke and throw on colorful movies, there's only so many times I could be like, there's another plane, oh shit, here comes the enemy airship, or I agree, we are ruining our planet, and yep, war is definitely bad. I agree with you, Miyazaki. But maybe when I rewatch all of these movies in 10 years, he will end up being one of my all-time favorite directors. So give me a decade, and I'll let you know if my thoughts change. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate it as always. Uh, this one was a bit shorter than the Nolan and Scorsese one, uh, just because I didn't have as much to say. And that's okay. That's gonna happen with certain directors because I just overall love doing these videos the most because going through a whole director's filmography, it's just something I enjoy. Shout out to Ryan for editing this video. He waited extra long for me to get him the script. I heavily appreciate him for that. If you made this point in the video, clearly this guy is talented at editing it. So you should give him a follow, request work. If you need someone to help you with editing. Ryan is the man. His stuff is right here. If you like the video, be sure to like the video. If you dislike the video because of my opinions, it's okay. We could argue, but I'd rather just talk about it. You know what I mean? Like I said, I like this guy. I like his work. It's just not my favorite and that's okay. But if you like my director reviews and how I go in depth on a director's work, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss any of the future ones for this year. We got a lot of them coming. Next up, we have David Fincher who, again, David Fincher, Scorsese, Miyazaki, all these videos were supposed to come out a while ago. They take way 
way longer than I ever thought they would, but we are already getting that started. So that one will be coming out relatively soon. So subscribe so you don't miss that one. Comment down below, what is your ranking of Miyazaki? What's your favorite? What's your least favorite? That's my favorite part of doing these videos, you know, seeing how other people's lists compare because it's very rare you'll get 100% of the same list as somebody else. And I think that's what's cool about talking about movies in the first place. And I guess that's it. So thank you guys so much again for watching as always. And I hope you have an awesome day.